get back It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Wise here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have a top entrepreneur that I've been waiting to have on for a long, long time. Dan Cushell, he's a dad, husband, thought leader, humanitarian, angel investor, and business growth specialist. And the bottom line is he helps simplify and grow businesses. One of the reasons I admire Dan so much is because he lists dad first and he lives it. And I have a lot to learn from you, Dan. We'll talk about some of your powerful rituals with your kids. Um, Dan's the founder of Growth to Freedom, prosperitybasedliving.com, creator of Millionaire's Mindset, one of his many companies had over 175 employees and had $25 million a year in sales. He's also an advisor and CEO with Prana Marketing and Joe Polish's Genius Network. And he's the best selling author of, here we go, A Champion in the Making, Awakening the Champion Within Your Life, Business, and Relationships. Dan, thank you so much for joining me. Jeremy, it's an honor, it's a privilege. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. <laughs> I'm excited and I always like to include a fun fact, but you know, I was listening, watching all your interviews and your videos and what was life like? I remember you saying there was a time when you were just getting like three or four hours of sleep and things were not balanced. What was life like during your busiest time? Oh, it was chaos. It was obsessive, compulsive, uh, 20 hour a day work week overall. Uh, it was you know, essentially having priorities completely jacked up, but I was so far into it, I didn't realize. I was like, you know, it's that old Zig Ziglar story where you're a frog in boiling water and you have two options. You can turn <laughs> it up like really massive heat right. or it's a slow burn. I was that frog on that slow burn. And then in 2007, Jeremy, uh, two weeks after my son was born, uh, I, I know we've talked about. It. I ended up in a hospital mm-hmm. with a you know a heart scare where they said I had a one and X chance of dying on the table. Yeah, I have that. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask about that too because that's a really tough time. So what was the, what was this 20 hours like? What were you doing during those 20 hours? What what kind of business was it at the time? Well, I had five companies operating. I had a media company, a merchant company. I had a coaching company, a consulting division, and you know all of these pieces worked together. So a lot of it was meetings with some of the key leadership on the teams. Most of the time I spent driving sales and marketing. So it was a lot of that, a lot of relationship building. Uh, Years ago I had a mentor that I met, his name was uh, Bill, and he had taught me early on, he says, you know, when you build a business, what's the one thing that most companies spend their time doing? And most people, you know, talk about the idea of prospecting. Right. Mm -hmm, Yeah. And he said, well, what if you could create systems in your business that ultimately allowed you to spend 80 percent of your time selling Mm. versus what most companies do? Because, you know, if you look at most traditional companies, traditional sales models, most of the time they spend 80 percent of their time prospecting Mm -hmm. and 20 percent of their time in the enrollment phase. And he said, well, what if you could create models that would allow you to spend 80 percent of your time enrolling? And twenty percent of your time yeah. prospecting. In other words, build great markets. Sounds good. Short, short version. Yeah. And so I fell in love with that process, that concept, back in the '90s. And in fact, my first company I started when I was 22 years old with the idea working with direct mail in the health club industry. Yeah. So what did you so, do in direct mail in the health club industry? What, what was it, what did it look like? So I, initially, I started off in a company, and you know, I I grew in this particular organization and became a VP, and then I was like. I've got a better way to do this. And I invented, um, we went in and did consulting for health clubs. It was a niche industry, the mom and pop independent clubs, Jeremy. And what we would do is we would profile those clubs. And essentially, if you were the owner, we'd come to you and go, uh, Dr. Weiss, if we could show you a way that we could drive 200 to 400 new members in your club, it wouldn't cost you anything. (laughs) And we'd front the expense on all the advertising to do it. 
right? Mm-hmm. And then on the profits, we'd have a 50-50 Sign split. Sign me up. Would you be open? Sign me up, And that, yeah. that was, our, that was right. our, our lead-in. And then what we would literally do is we would go in for these independent clubs, and we would do a direct mail campaign and generate anywhere from 200 to 400 wow. members on a gift type membership. So you'd get a mail piece that was targeted in that area. It would say, congratulations, Dr. Weiss. You've been selected to receive a gift membership at XYZ Fitness. Mm. Your membership includes XYZ, ABC, all these different things. It's valued at X dollars. To claim your gift membership, simply call the number in the next 48 hours, right? So it had urgency. And then it had an asterisk that said, small maintenance fee applies. So now you would call into the club, you know, the, the, the club, we would go ahead and take those phone calls, we would book for an appointment, do a tour, and then we had this alternate day, two or three year type program that we would offer. That's how I got my start. We'd wow. go around, you know, I started, I think my first direct client we had was in, I wanna say Mountain View, California. Hmm. And when I built this company, one of the unique factors, because there were other companies doing these promotions for clubs, yeah. but we went in and did sales training for them. We did customer service training. This is back in, by the way, 1992. And back then, I had gotten my first Apple PowerBook, is what they were called back then. I don't know if you, you followed Apple's story, but I had a PowerBook and I met a programmer because I had this vision that I could transform the health club industry because I had met all these great people. They were hardworking guys, but yeah. most of them had no clue about running a business right. and definitely not a lot about sales. At least that was my perception. So I created a custom uh, sales assessment back in 1992. I hired a program. I remember his name. I've looked at, look, tried to find him for years. His name was Cyrus. I thought you were going to say, like, his name was Steve Jobs. No, I'm just no. <laughs> <laughs> he, he actually worked at Apple and uh, he, he, was a, a a guy who had gotten uh, stock and cashed out early. Oh wow! So I hired you him as a pro. Find him. This guy, yeah. I can't I can't find him anymore. He's on an island somewhere, probably. And uh, so we created this custom software that you would take this assessment. This is back in nineteen. Wow, that's amazing. What yeah. did the internet look like in nine? Well, I mean, was there even anything on the web? I mean, well, it wasn't a web based. It was yeah. a platform based. Oh, good. That's we would build in. So you'd come in, wow. operate off our machine, take the assessment, and then it would give That's you amazing in sales. Like we had seven categories, and it would give you your strengths, your weaknesses, and then mm. of course the training we did would improve all the weaknesses, but make your wow. strengths even better. That's what. Wow. That's how it came into the clubs. What made you even think to do that at that time? Because that, I mean, now that seems normal, but then that's completely abnormal. You know, I, I think for me, I look at where are the holes, and being a problem solver, I was like, you know, this would be a, a great fit. I, you know, I, I don't claim to invent a whole lot on my own. I just see where there's holes, find right. opportunities. And I probably, you know, thinking of my mentors, I've been a big fan of Tony Robbins over the years at that time. Uh, I've been to a few of his programs. Tom Hopkins, I was a big fan of. So it was yeah. probably a combination of my thinking, coaching, and yeah. guidance from programs from Tony Robbins and Tom Hopkins, thinking of putting this into a niche industry like yeah. the health club industry. Yeah. And, and the direct mail piece is really interesting, Dan. You know, at the time, what did the mechanics look like? I mean, do you get a list of just people in the surrounding area of health clubs or? What do you do? Yeah, back then, uh, what I remember we would do is we would profile the club. We did, uh, there were several categories, demographics, income, um, if they owned it versus rent, right? Mm -hmm. And then it was in a certain circumference near the club. And then we also did certain selects that were related to if they had an interest in health. That could have been publications, magazines, health products, different things like that. Right. And so we would purchase these lists. Yeah. You know, we used to, I think a company, one of the companies we used was Donnelly, another company was RL Polk at the time. I don't I don't know that they're even still around. Uh, but it was a it was a scientific business to right. research these selects. We'd do the surrounding club. We usually yeah. drop a test of about two thousand to four thousand pieces, start yeah. small, yeah. see the result we would get. We'd usually get a, up to a five percent response. So if we sent out a thousand, that's get that's amazing, isn't it? I mean, that's, re- that's really good. Yeah, it's solid. And then we'd book yeah. half of those that would come in, and we had about five different mail pieces that we use. It's very mm. personalized back then. It'd have your name, you know, certain criteria that were dropped into it. Uh, that we were doing again back. This is 1991, 92, 93 ish, right. right? Yeah. So it was a lot. It was a lot of fun. So we get the list, but I remember going, Jeremy. Literally, we'd get the mail, and we didn't trust the post offices. You know the old Halbert things. You know the post office. 
And we, I remember going to the post offices and inspecting our bags <laughs> that we had of mail pieces that they were actually getting out. Because, you know, we were talking about thousands of pieces right. a day in many cases going wow. out and having this uh, turn and or sending one of our team to go down and do that. Yeah. And how did you know at the time what, I mean, obviously you said you created that urgency and you had certain components of the direct mail, mail piece. Were you always in uh, copywriting and direct marketing or who did you learn that from at the time? Yeah, co copywriting, I, uh, there was a guy that I learned from from the previous company that I worked with. His name was Kerry. Mm -hmm. And then um, the guy that was really good at the list aspect of it because the list like anything it's your your message is one piece of it right. and a lot of people fall in love with the message but right. my personal belief is even more important than the message right is the list right. I think the list is far more important and all yeah. even today on the internet I think the same thing holds true so his name yeah. was Marshall yeah. uh, he lived in Michigan which is where I'm from and he was just like this evil genius when it came to, to lists and the science of lists and even dealing with the yeah. brokers and so on. So we were lucky enough to have him on our team. So I learned a lot from him yeah. about not only the list selection, but also the messaging, the copy. And then I've always been fascinated by uh, psychology, yeah. right? And the psychology in print and direct mail and then also in, in influence and selling. Yeah. And we're going to get into those five companies and how you even did that all at once. But I want to go back to, you know, the fun fact. I have a few fun facts. And... One, you played semi-professional baseball, right? Yep. And I was watching like a short news clip and it said like Cabrini second baseman. Was that high school? Yeah, that high was school. high school. Okay. What were they interviewing you about? Well, we were um, we had finished a tournament. We won the tournament. Mm. And um, myself and another player, we were named co-MVP of that particular, mm. particular tournament, as I recall. Mm. Yeah. So tell me about your baseball career. So, you know, you grew up in Detroit. Yep, right. Southwest Detroit near uh, Southwestern High School. Yeah. Uh, most people may know Jalen Rose, who's really big on sure. you know ESPN. I'm in and Chicago, sports. and he was on the Bulls for a little while. Yep. Oh yeah. So Jalen uh, Rose went to a high school that I lived about two miles mm, from. Yeah. And, and a, you know, there's a lot of history at uh, Southwestern. But I grew up in Southwest Detroit. I thought baseball for me would actually be the way out of the, out of the city. Really? So and you ultimately, always growing up, you wanted to be a professional baseball player. Yes, when you were from young. the time I was seven years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I had a lot of fun. Um, but you were really talented. It's not like you just had this dream and you were talented. Uh, what was your baseball career like in high school? And you played in college too, and, and beyond. Yeah, so I, I played. Uh, you know, little league coming up. I played uh, high school. You know, I, I played varsity pretty quickly. I was a 400 career hitter in wow. high school, and then went on to college. And I had some injuries. My senior year of high school, things car started to shift. I was on some draft draft list as a you know top prospect, and mm. and I had some big colleges come out. And I remember uh, Clemson coming out to my high school, and we did. I did a private workout like in the, the middle. Tigers, of The Tigers, they're really good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, was it Dave Holiday, I think, or Dave Littlefield was uh, the, the uh, head coach at that time. You know, I had talked to a lot of professional scouts, and there was a, a good chance that I was going to get drafted. But about two-thirds through my senior year of high school, I ended up tearing my rotator cuff. Jeez. I went back on the hole. You know, in, in Michigan in the spring, it, it can be kind of cold. Freezing. Uh, as you probably know, <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah. I remember it was like a 37-degree day. I'm in my yeah. turtleneck. I go in the hole at shortstop, I cock my arm back and I felt it pop and then I threw oh. and I felt it pull. And I, I have a football mentality and a pain at times doesn't hurt. Right. <laughs> so I kept playing. Mm. And you know, I remember that particular game, there were probably six, seven, eight, maybe ten scouts there. Yeah. And I didn't want, you know, that old idea, don't let them see you sweat. I didn't want to let on that I had hurt myself. Things were different back then in 19, I think this would have been 1987, yeah. uh, as far as surgery and different things. So I was, I mean, I literally within three innings at Jeremy, I couldn't lift my arm above oh, my shoulder. God. And it was excruciating. So I started in between innings, I would take my time getting out there and I literally would catch the ball and flip it. There was a guy back then in the, I believe he played for the Toronto Blue Jays. His name was Tony Fernandez which he used to just catch and throw it from underneath. And so I just started doing that between innings to buy time. But within about five innings, I was oh, in man. so much pain, I literally couldn't lift my arm up. Well, yeah. long story short, I was afraid to go to the doctors. I uh, You didn't want to hear I, what they had to say. 
Yeah, I was afraid. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to go from being this top rated prospect to being cut, right? Because yeah. it was just so different back then. And I ended up taking five or six days off. I remember a friend of mine, uh, I, I went to the doctor, they gave me some Motrin. And I played through the pain, but I was doing more damage to it right, at, at right. the end of the day. And what ended up happening, long story short, the big prospect list kind of decreased. So I had two schools, a Division One school called University of Detroit, and then a small school in Grand Rapids, Michigan called Aquinas College, and then, a, and then Central Michigan University were the last like three mm -hmm. that were interested in, in uh, having me play with them. And I ended up choosing the small school in Grand Rapids, Michigan, because they, you know, ultimately for my family, it was more important to have certain funding <laughs> and right. grants and things. And so that financially ended up being the best scenario. So I went to uh, Aquinas. Yeah. And, you know, my you know, first two years, I ended up having, you know, pretty good years. I don't know, 330, 340, whatever yeah, it was. That's amazing. Yeah. But then I had several more injuries during that time. I ended up transferring to Wayne State University. Uh, which was closer to home. It ended up being a great thing. I ended up all conference my, uh, I think, junior and or senior year or something. Then I played. I, I'll never forget my last game when I realized that my hopes of playing pro ball were going to be over. Was this at Wayne State or where? It was at Wayne, Wayne State. State. Okay. Yeah, and it was, uh, yeah, I remember crying in the dugout. You know, thinking yeah. about you know, all these dreams now going to, you know, that was, I remember my last at bat was, uh, it was kind of a summation of my career. Oh, by the way, halfway through my senior year, I got bored. This kind of also ties into my entrepreneurial thing, the quirks. I, and this story actually probably even ties into those quirks because it's all over the place. Um, but halfway through my senior year, Jeremy, I remember getting bored. And I was a right-handed hitter all the way through until halfway through my senior year. And I, I don't like where this is going. <laughs> experimenting like and started hitting left-handed. Wow. And what ended up happening is we found out that I had far more power naturally left-handed than right-handed like this. Wow. Uh, and so literally my senior year, halfway through the year, I start becoming a switch hitter, which ended up improving my, my chances and my game and, and, and so on, which, which was a lot of fun. But I remember my last at bat at Wayne State, I came up to the plate left-handed and um, – I think we had a chance to win the game. I hit a rocket down the first baseline. The first baseman made a leaping catch, mm. and I collapsed at home plate because I I tear a intercostal muscle in my ribs, Jeez. <laughs> and I just like fall down at home plate. But that was my last at bat, as I recall. And uh, you know, I I remember thinking to myself, "Wow, this is this is it." You know, here's all these dreams that now have gone. And then I ended up coaching. Uh, college all-star teams. I volunteered as a hitting coach at Wayne State for mm -hmm. about a year or so. Coached the college all-star teams for two summers. And uh, I played a buddy of mine while I was coaching. His name was Dave. He started this. He had a semi-pro team. Hmm. And he knew from my college days, he's like, why don't you come out and, and play? And so I played one last game before I did hang him up playing semi-pro. And I went three for four. <laughs> Why'd you hang it up then? And you go three for four. Because my arm, oh, my, my arm just couldn't, couldn't take oh, it. Oh, it's horrible. And so, so anyway. That, that's, that's devastating. That's, you know, I hate to hear that. You know, how do you think baseball helped you in business? Oh, in every way. Every way. First of all, I have my dad. I'm so grateful for my dad. Uh, his thinking since I was a little kid. First of all, he was always an encourager. Mm -hmm. Go for your dreams. And with an asterisk. Dan, if you take, he said, Dan, if you'll take the same approach at life. And this, it used to say, it, Dan, if you take the same approach at pursuing anything else that you have with baseball, you'll be successful no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. Because I've always, everything I've uh, chosen to do, I've dove into it. I'm obsessed with it. You know, I just want to be the very best that I, I can be. I leave it all out on the field, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So baseball taught me a lot. And I'm thankful, so grateful for my dad. He was my coach as a kid, uh, you know, coming up. And he introduced me to personal development at about mm. nine or ten years old. Really? My first success camp or clinic or seminar was at Eastern University, uh, Eastern Michigan University in uh, Ypsilanti, Michigan. It's a little rural area this side yeah, of uh, I've heard of it. Yeah. This, this side of Ann Arbor, right? And I went there. I remember the coach Ron Ostrike, and uh, his pitching coach was Roger Coriel. You're getting me to think back to the past here, and. 
I remember sitting through that camp for a day and a half with my dad and there were a lot of things they were teaching tips and strategies and you know you know balance and you know how to hit better throw better all these yeah. things but I remember the one thing that even today stands out there was a section in there about PMA positive mental attitude mm. that the, the game is 90% mental right. and 10% physical right. and I believe that in business it's 90% mental 10% physical right and that's carried with me I yeah. think in all my years of entrepreneurship the other things you know teamwork uh, camaraderie yeah. the ability to lead the ability to uh, guide you know Joe Polish you know you mentioned earlier uh, working with Joe at Genius Network one of the things I respect and appreciate about Joe so much is that it's not a guru platform he talks about it in terms, I think it's a Gary Helber quote, be the guide from the side, not the sage from the stage. Mm, I like right? that, yeah. And, you know, so sports really gave me a great platform to also be myself. I was, I was like, the other thing about me as a kid, yeah. I was very shy, really? quiet, reserved. Mm. Uh, I was, I would actually say. You lead by example. I was probably, I was probably a, a social misfit. Really? In high school. Yes. Yes. In many ways. I don't ways, know if I believe that. A social misfit? I, I think I was on that border. Uh, how, do you, how do you define social misfit? What, what were you doing that was... Well, I think I was just shy and introverted. And, mm -hmm. and I remember, you know, there were girls that I had talked to that ultimately they were like, you know, you actually are so shy that you come across sometimes as stuck up, which oh, wow. always was baffling to me. Mm -hmm. But when I got on a baseball field... Or in any yeah. of the sports, but mostly baseball, a, I had a different personality. Yeah. Confident, uh, clear. Mm. You know, I had my goals. I knew what I wanted to do. I was, you know, a leader on the field. I could direct. I could yeah. guide. You know, I let others be important as a leader. You yeah. know, edification. You know, so I learned coaching. I learned a lot of those types of things yeah. through sport, and then especially teamwork yeah. and bringing bringing you know in business. In our business, Jeremy, as you know, running your companies and doing what you do, it's about getting the right players on your team right? and getting them in the right positions and setting them up to win, right? right? You know, if you put a pitcher in the major leagues in right field, you know, you're not going to win a lot of games in the major <laughs> league level, right? right. Uh, so the same thing in business. You want to make sure to have the right people in the right positions on your right team doing the right things. Efficient and effective right do the right things yeah and do things right yeah so yeah i mean i think yogi Berra said something like what you're saying like you know the game's 90 percent mental and the other half is mental or something like that <laughs> <laughs> yes so 90 <laughs> percent uh mental and the other half physical <laughs> right, right. Yeah. so um your dad was he always a big baseball fan what did your dad do because he seemed like be in that positive mental attitude from you know how he raised you yeah, so great, great question. My dad, uh, my dad was a blue collar worker. He was a line worker for General Motors, mm. and part of what inspired me, I think, to be more independent and entrepreneurial was watching him go at General Motors, be laid off. I think he was laid off as a kid from the time I was a kid till twenty. I think nine different times, Jeremy. Wow. Jeez. And so that instability yeah. said for me anyway. Hey, you need to create your own thing. And yeah. so when he would get laid off, he was entrepreneurial. I mean, he started a printing company that I actually helped him with when I was you know, like 13, 14 ish. Mm -hmm. So I got a chance to be around him as an entrepreneur. He had a bar restaurant. Uh, there was a whole experience with that that we'll save for another time. But I got to see that I was like 10 years old and, yeah. and watched and experienced that. So he had these entrepreneurial, you know, he started looking into Robert Allen. I remember one of the books he had mm. when I was a kid was No Money Down Real Estate. Yeah. And so I remember reading a little bits and pieces of it. And again, right. the things that I took away from it were some of the uh, attitude things. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think I could spend a full two hours just on your fun facts. Because so the other one is you have more fun amusement parks than your kids. And so I want to get into your – you have a really amazing ritual with your kids at dinner where you, you go through the five questions. I was yeah. wondering if you can go through those a little bit for, for people Absolutely. Yeah. It'd be an honor. I, I know I'm you know, really proud of this because it's you know, really a bonding time for, for Kira, Kyler, myself, my wife. Yeah. And you know, we have fun with it. And so, uh, number one, it's you know, what are you grateful for? Mm -hmm. Right? 
you know, in business, you know, you know, I'll tie this in as well, you know, whether it's with your family, your team, your companies, you know, I think there's five skill sets that I think for all of us will determine how successful we are, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. uh, number one is emotional mastery. Number two is the ability to influence. Number three is the ability to market, right? And four, and number five, I'll call it selection or hiring. What right? was number four? And it skipped out for a second there. So emotion, influence, market. And productiv personal productivity. Productivity, okay. Yep. And then last would be selection or, and or hiring. Mm -hmm. Right? Because selection of the wrong mate can cost you a fortune. Right? <laughs> Emotionally too. Emotionally yes. too, yeah. Yeah. And selection of the right mate, you know, in life can be a great multiplier for us. Happy wife, likewise, happy life. Yeah. Happy wife, happy life. My wife in tells business, me that every day. So <laughs> that's right. We must be getting going. Our wives must be giving us the same training program. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And hiring, right? Same kind of thing. When you add the right people with the right capabilities and attitude, your business can multiply. And likewise, if you hire a dud, you, you usually it costs the business too. So mm -hmm. in all those areas. So with my kids, we, you know, number one, we have the Kushel value. So I'll start there, yeah, right? Yeah. And the Kushel values are based on the acronym CHAMPION, C-H-A-M-P-I-O-N. Yeah. And the kids' version, my kids right now are nine and seven. They'll get the more extended version in a couple more years. Yeah. Uh, but the you know kids' version for now, C, is, is uh, choose, right? Mm -hmm. That everything we do is a choice, mm -hmm. right? Whether we're happy, whether we're sad, uh, it's a choice. We mm. ultimately make that choice. Right. We have complete control of that choice of how we go into anything. Yeah. Next is H. That's health. Make health a priority. Like that, I talked about my hospital experience. Yeah. You know, when it's not the priority, everything else gets impacted. You can have all the money in the world if you lose your Doesn't health. You know, how many times do we hear this being a big regret from people, right? So yeah. health. Three is be an action taker, right? You know, it's often been said that knowledge is power. Well, knowledge is power, but action right. is power multiplied, right? right? And you'll learn more yeah. in five minutes of doing than, you know, all kinds of theoretical type learning. Yeah. So be an action taker. M is uh, mentoring, right? Mm. You know, who's your coach? You know, yeah. we're fortunate, we're blessed to have our kids and, you know, the school that they're in. Uh, you know, they're, I'm grateful that they have certain coaches with my daughter with, you know, certain music, certain, my, my son with sports. Yeah. I watched so, that video of her. That's really, she's really talented um, of her singing. Yeah, that was Thank amazing. You. Thank you. It's shocked the heck out of me too. <laughs> You hadn't heard and that feel, before when you heard that? Well, it was a surprise. We can come oh. back to that. Okay, I'll share go that. ahead. That was an incredible, yeah. incredible Father's Day surprise. Yeah. That just took my heart away. I mean, I, I was bawling like a, you know, a, a baby. It was yeah. like crazy. And as you should be. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So C-H-A-M, mentoring. Mm -hmm. uh, P is uh, passion and purpose, mm -hmm. right? You know, live with passion and purpose. I is invest in ourselves. Mm -hmm. O is be an opportunity seeker. And N is never quit on me. Right. And uh, so that's the champion, the champion acronym. So those are the values, A, that we, we talk about uh, in our household. Yeah. Then at dinner, we have the five questions. So what am I grateful for right now? Right. I believe the, the biggest solution, Jeremy, to fear mm. is gratitude. Yeah. Plain and simple. You know, if we can live in a spirit of gratitude all the time, like I, you know, we can talk about some of my other rituals that, yeah. you know, have ultimately evolved over the last couple of years since my health experience. But the more time that I find that I'm in gratitude and that I observe people it truly in a spirit of gratitude, mm -hmm. they're they're in their peak state, peak performance, ultimate confidence, ultimate faith, the ability to contribute, the ability to love, right? Yeah. With, right? With uh, just pure, unbiased love, right? Connect, the ability to be able to go out and make a difference, to be significant, live with purpose, meaning, all of those things, I think it stems from this you know, this little seed of yeah. gratitude. So we start with that question. What am I grateful for today, yeah. right now? What am I happy about right now, mm -hmm. right? What have I done well today, right? And I created these three questions actually for me about, I don't know, a decade ago. I had, you know, the book you, you showed earlier mm -hmm. uh, and we talked about earlier, you know, I talk about these three, three yeah, main questions. I have them earmarked. They're on page like uh, 21 where you talk about the champion's quest and uh, it really stuck out to me. Yeah. Yeah. And so 
What have I done well? I built in there because I have been historically one of my faults, you know, even as an athlete was I beat myself up a lot. That's a horrible thing to do in baseball, too, because Hall of Famers still, you know, you know, don't get a base hit 70 percent of the time. (laughs) Exactly. You got in the wrong sport. That's right. And so, you know, it's relative to to what you do. Right. And who you are. And so the the what have I done well really was for me in the beginning. Yeah. And it's something that I've loved. My kids have come to love. But the next two questions are the one that it seems they have the most joy, the most fun, Mm. the most passion and purpose with is what mistakes did we make today? Mm. And really embrace that. And I got this from a a member of Joe Joe's Genius Network, right, at 25kgroup.com. John John Carter and his wife Maria uh, I was having a conversation with them actually at Necker Island with Richard Branson that you know, we, we, I've done with, uh, with Joe a couple times, been blessed to do that. And we were you know, talking about how we raise our kids and some of the things, and they brought this up that they have a conversation with their kids about the mistakes. Mm. I was like, oh, I've got to add that into my questions, yeah. right? So yeah. I give them the full credit. And guess which question of these four so far that my kids love the most? The mistakes it's this of, one, the mistakes. They've now come to just love it. And they're like, they're not embarrassed anymore. They're not humiliated. Yeah. They're not feeling like they're lesser than, right? Yeah. I mean, if we look at all of us, at the end of the day, what are our two greatest fears at a core, you know, call it subprimal level? The fear of loss of love mm-hmm. and the fear of not being good enough. Yeah. Right? And so I'm on this quest that I want to create kids with amazing self-esteem, amazing confidence, the ability to love, feel significant any moment in time, right? And this question, you know, is I feel it's a a game changer. It's been a game changer for me, even in my attitude, right? And being okay with those mistakes. And then the fifth question, Jeremy, is what what have I learned from it? What what am I learning from Mm. this mistake, right? With the idea that mistakes are okay, let's just not make the same one over and over again. Right. Yeah. That's why I love these interviews and talking like successful people like you is because because of that one. What mistakes, you know, people often see Dan, he's this all powerful business guru, uh, you know, very successful. And when you talk, you know, we realize like people still make mistakes. They still were in a rut at times. And it's just good to ground us that it's normal. That's perfectly yes. normal. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and for me, I, I can also say that that's been a learned thing Mm -hmm. right because what you taught what you just shared is you know when you picture business people you know always being successful and not really you know we don't want to I don't think many of us want to necessarily come out and admit our flaws and and mistakes yet it what I've learned is that actually that's what makes us relatable yeah is talking about those so you know I've had I've had my share fair share of mistakes over the years from bankruptcy to divorce to to, you know, I've had, you know, the nine companies I've run, I've had a couple of them that didn't work out so well, right? right? I've had failed uh, business relationships, but that's what makes us better. And I think for me, the thing that I pride myself on, Jeremy, is just staying in the game, right? You know, Mike Tyson's quote, which is everybody's got a plan until they get hit. (laughs) (laughs) Especially by him, yeah. (laughs) And, you know, how I I view it, I think one of my... uh, traits of success and also probably can be looked at as, uh, you know, maybe a flaw is that I'll take a punch and I'll just keep staying in there when Mike Tyson is beating the hell out of me and, and I'll keep wanting to get up and say, give me more, give me more. <laughs> but now at least I can talk about it. <laughs> Obviously, with the, the, it showed with your shortstop and, you know, when you got injured that time, you just kept trucking even That's though it. your arm was ready to fall off. Yes. So, Dan, what's been some of the memorable answers you've gotten from your kids that stick out, whether it's the grateful for or what they're happy about or what they did well or mistakes? What what sticks out with one of those dinners that you're like, holy, this is amazing, some of the answers you got? Yeah, so I'm, there's so many, yeah. frankly. Uh, they, well, My kids, I mean, you have kids, right? Mm-hmm. And so they say the, the, the most incredible thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, I learn a lot from my kids. I mean, it's taught me to be a better dad, a better husband, a better leader, a better entrepreneur, all of it. I think they, I would have to put them right up there as probably a couple of my greatest mentors today. Um, so as far as specific that I'm trying yeah, to think, maybe pick one, like you said, they light up with the mistakes. What, what did they say that, um, what mistakes you made today? And 
and they just lit up. Yeah, let me let me think uh, about that. The what mistakes have they been so proud of where they've lit up? Yeah, they seem to light up over most of them. Yeah, uh, and a specific one. You know, like my daughter, for example, in her math class, right? She just got uh, double promoted here not too long ago. Uh, and she loves math, right? And she loves story problem. Like one of my favorite classes was finite mathematics mm. when, I, when I was in college. And so she loves these story problems. And she's, she's pretty sharp on them. And I remember the, you know, here not too long ago, I think it was last, right before the summer break that they went on. She, we, we were going through their work together in the morning and she was sharing it with me and she goes, Daddy, I made this mistake on this math. It was such a silly mistake. I can't believe I made it, right? It's, it's more of those, that kind Very of energy. Very playful, yeah. Very playful. Uh, just, it's more of the spirit of it, Jeremy, than mm -hmm. say a specific yeah. I got you, you know, answer. You know, yeah. I hope, and my son is very, very similar. Now he copies off his sister Carol <laughs> with his his attitudinal things. But Kyler, like I'm trying to think of something. Uh, Kyler said, "Well, we when we went to the beach here the other day, uh, we went boogie boarding, and he he was surfing, and then he flipped his board over while he was boogie boarding, and so I remember him just cracking up about it, and it was the spirit of it. Yeah, you know, just you know, and I like that. I think." The spirit that I picked up from my kids that stands out in, in the way you're asking the question is enjoy every moment, whether it's a, a mistake or whether it's uh, something we've done well, yeah. right? Enjoy it all because you just never yeah. know when, when it's going to go. Yeah. It kind of goes back to the C in champion, which is choosing. You know, like you can say that I made this mistake and be down on yourself, or you can say it in the spirit of, I made this silly mistake, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I like that. Yeah. So going back to, so Dan, what the early days of your career, you're 22, you start your first company, what did you decide to do? That was uh, the health. Oh, that was the health company. The health, yeah, oh, that was right. the health company oh, doing wow. direct mail and uh, then doing consulting for those health clubs. Hmm. And so, uh, you know, we would go in, do the promotions, do the consulting, and I, I, was 22 and very naive. You know, I did the business on a, a handshake partnership and, you know, ultimately it was my responsibility, but it ended up not working out after about 18 months. Mm -hmm. And I had to regroup and, you know, start all over again. And then, uh, then I ended up in the uh, skincare business, believe it or not. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. And then the nutrition business. And then I started a nutrition company, uh, partnered with a group. And we had a nutritional company. This would have been in 1993-ish, 94, mm. where we were one of apparently the first companies at that time marketing a pro uh, ingredients called pycnogenol, which at that time was revolutionary mm -hmm. as far as its health benefits and then antioxidants. We teamed up with a gentleman named Dr. Jack Pfeiffer, and he would actually come to the health clubs that we built as clients, and we would do events and seminars and promotions and we would sell, you know, a fair amount of products as a result. And it was there were distributorships that got built out of that. So that was a lot of fun. How did you get and, into nutritionals? Well, being uh, someone health oriented, yeah. It it for me was you know from sports. I was always looking for ways to mm, get an edge. edge you know, yeah. obviously the big controversy in in some sports right now has been like HGH. You know, steroids. I remember I had friends of mine who introduced me to the idea of trying steroids back when I was 15. So really? this would have been 1985, right? And they were, um, I ended up not choosing to do it because I did, so I actually did a thesis in high school on it because I was just curious. Right. And at the time, I was researching people like Lyle Elzado and a lot of the ex NFL sure, players sure. and what the health deterioration yeah. and the health, ben, uh, horrible health, effects. Yeah. yeah, the impact of it. And so for me, it made it an absolute no not to do. Um, so, so I was looking for other ways, nutrition-wise. Mm. And so I got introduced to nutrition products and uh, you know, fell in love with a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. What did you learn from working with the nutritional company? Working with the nutritional company, uh, the biggest thing is that you know, similar to the C in Champion is we all, all of us have a shelf life, number one. 
And if we take care of ourselves, we have a longer shelf life. You know, I think it shows that we can live to be about 120 years. You, you, one of your recent interviews with Dave Kech, Kekich, yeah. and uh, uh, where he's huge on longevity. Yes. And then Mark Rose, who I listened to that interview here yeah. that you did recently, yeah. also on longevity, right? And there's, you know, obviously contradictory facts as far as the age for us. But at right. that time, this is back in the 90s when yeah. the antioxidants were starting to come on the scene. Right. That we can control the longevity of our life. And I think at that early stage, Jeremy, in my career, I treated myself more like an all-pro, all-star athlete than I did in the middle. And then now the last handful of years, I've gotten back to treating myself mm -hmm. as the all-pro, all-star athlete mm -hmm. to operate at peak performance. And it's where those rituals come in and what we put in our body. I mean, we are what we eat. Garbage in, garbage out. And that shows yeah. up in all kinds of ways. Yeah. So what was after the nutritional company? What did you do? So what was the next company? Then I ended up with a company that uh, offered a variety of different products, uh, from health products to water treatment units to air treatment units. So it was an environmental company, believe it or not. Hmm. And we would sell distributorships. And part of that, what I became so intrigued with, this, so this would have been 1994, by the way. And I worked with that company from 94 through about, two, about 1999 or 2000, if I recall. And they had a seminar company, and I fell in love with personal development. Yeah. And really, it was a vehicle for that particular company where we promoted these events. And so literally, over the course of about eight years, on average, I was attending two personal development seminars for this company every month. Wow. Right? And that's where I really feel that I really got indoctrinated with the personal development side of things, the ability to influence, the ability to market even better. And I knew at that point, personally, I wanted to be in an environment where I could inspire, where I could in educate others to be at their fullest potential. Mm -hmm. So then were you, um, you were going to these two times a month. So then did you get involved in, that was one of your businesses too, right? Yes. So we would, uh, we had offices all over the country. And so I would travel to these different types of offices and I started doing presentations for the company. And so at that time, one of the skills I honed in on was was recruiting, essentially, mm -hmm. a, a recruiting or hiring capability. And literally, in the course of a week, I think I was seeing somewhere near 50 to 100 people a week wow. that we would interview as potential candidates to work with That's us in wow. this distributorship in this company. So, you know, when you put... It's like condensing time frames, you know, 100 people a week, 50 a week, that's 5,000 people a year that you're, you know, talking to. Right. And that didn't include the people that were Weeded also. out, yeah. Well, then on top of that, there were other people in the, these are just the people I was talking to mm. weekly. Then there were maybe 10 or 12 other people in our offices almost doing the same kind of thing. So we would do, you know, so I was doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviewing. I was also, we were marketing, we were also doing selling. Uh, in addition to that, Jeremy, we were doing trainings two times a week, like on a Wednesday, we do an evening training, and on Saturday, and most of those trainings I was doing. So I also learned public speaking. I learned how to be able to present from the stage in front of groups, right? And uh, so it really was just, it was a platform of developing all these different skills and talents yeah. and abilities that were a lot of fun. So how were you getting 100 people that you were interviewing? Was it marketing. more direct marketing? Yeah, direct marketing. We'd run ads in different locations and then they would, you know, respond by phone and then we would go through an interview process. Yeah, this seems to be obviously like a big pain in business. What do you advise people or what tips do you have for like recruiting and hiring is if you go on Facebook and any of these groups, like that is one of the number one questions you're getting. Well, what should my hiring process look like, recruiting process? What what tips do you have for people who want to find those good team players after talking to over probably 10,000 or more people. Yeah, I think it's been over 22,000. 20, 22, <laughs> I've calculated. And it may even be double that. But I'm it's, sure it's, it's a ton, 20, yeah. 22,000 overall. That's that wild. I've done that with. And so, so a, a, a simple process, and we actually have, and I'd be happy to share it with your, your audience if you mm -hmm. want a video that I've created mm -hmm. that goes through a blueprint, um, or we can figure out a way to yeah, get that. Yeah, I could to link you. it. I could link it if there's yeah. a, yeah. I'll be happy to do that. And, but I'll give the short version. Number yeah. one, hire slow, yeah. right? Fire fast. Mm -hmm. 
uh, create a process. So Joe Polish in Genius Network, right? He has this acronym that I love. It's Elf versus Half. So you can have an Elf business, which is easy, lucrative, and fun, or a Half business, which is hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating. And a lot of us, I know, I've fallen prey to this, this success trap of having more models that are half in nature than elf, mm -hmm. right? So building an elf model means, create, I believe, creating a marketing system for recruiting. So number one, uh, get very clear on what you want. I see so many, and I've done this too, is I hadn't been clear. I go, okay, I want to hire uh, an executive assistant. And instead of thinking through exactly what I want, what do I want them to do, describing it out, listing it out, having a conversation with someone like you or I, right, or a colleague or a peer. I go, yeah, I want to hire an executive. And, and just talking through, well, what are the things that I really want them to do? What are the qualities that, what do I absolutely, what are some of the values that they, and literally mm -hmm. describing it, putting a description together, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, another technique someone could use to do that, you know, go on, uh, I don't know, Fiverr and have someone write a description and use that as a baseline and then start modifying it. At least it gives someone jumping off points. So number right. one, it's identify what do you really want in that person yeah. all the way through from the uh, duties they'll have, the uh, tasks they'll do, to their background, to their, their values. Yeah. Right Now, you may not use all of those in an ad, but essentially that's going to become the piece for, say, an ad that you would place. Right. Right. Now, I like to use mechanisms, Jeremy, like direct response marketing that cast a wide net. So the next step, once you identify what you want, is cast a net, right? So you cast the net. Great ways to do that today are things like uh, ZipRecruiter.com is a great platform because you can put it one place and it'll, it'll go to Monster, it'll go to LinkedIn, mm. Facebook, and yeah. all these different different resources. And there are other ones like that, yeah. but th that's a simple one. Yeah. Uh, so you place the ad, then you, you give them a unique way to apply. Now, most people are used to the resume style, and that's an okay way to start. Uh, however, we create, I like to create entrepreneurial surveys, right? And just to get a feel, especially if you're an entrepreneurial company or a small business, create an entrepreneurial, and again, I'll be happy to supply the template for this, but just to give the overview yeah, right now. Yeah. Uh, so you create the entrepreneurial survey that you make part of the requirement for them to fill out. So now if they send you a resume and do the survey, it's going to give you a different perspective of who they are as a step. Yeah. So that's that. I would call that the first or second step, cast or third step. Identify what you want, cast a net. So that's the ad itself. Step three, entrepreneur survey. Yeah. Step four, after they submit the resume and or the survey or both, have them record a video of why they'd be an ideal candidate for you. Right now, back when I was doing this, even in 1994, right with this company I was mentioning. We didn't have video that we used like that then, but we were having people leave voice messages. I gotcha. Tell yeah. us why you'd be an ideal candidate. Today, you, we do it with video. Yeah. And you're only looking for about a two-minute message, and you, you do give them some guidelines of how to construct it, why they'd be a good fit. But now it gives you an idea of their person personality, yeah. their energy. I mean, there's just different factors that you can evaluate. Yeah. Once they've done those things, one of the ways you can do it is now you take – all of those candidates that may fit a good profile for you and bring them in to do a group overview of your company, right? Or a group interview. So you might have 6, 10, 12, 15 people sitting in, but it's using time effectively instead yeah. of doing a bunch of one-on-ones, right. right? First of all, you've you've screened people out, right, Jeremy, in each of these steps. So you've taken a lot you filter right. down. Some people now will you, not leave the voicemail or they won't do the video and that filters them out, yeah. Exactly. And now you've got likely the better candidates. So you do a group overview, group interview. And what we like to do is we like to put people through a process of our onboarding up front. So for example, we have what we call the genius playbook. And we go through the values of the company. We go through the purpose of the company. We go through our unique selling proposition. We go through our focus as a company. And then we go through some of the demographics. And we go through this very fast with the candidates. And they're mm -hmm. taking notes and all this and then we ask them to turn that in, mm. right? Because we want to see what they are really picking up, right? Right. And depending on what positions you're filling for, if it's administrative positions, if it's you know maybe an account executive, an admin assistant, or a, a marketing assistant, any of these. So what they pick up, the details matter, right? Yeah, so big time. It's a, yeah. You put them into a role similar to what they're going to be doing. When I was hiring salespeople, 
literally what we would do after they'd leave a message, I'd have a team member call me, hey, I heard your message, I'm just not, I wanted to call you, thank you for your application, I'm just not really feeling it as far as your ability to work with us as a salesperson. In other words, give an objection. <laughs> See if they come back. Right. And, yeah. and if they didn't, right, if they didn't and they were like, oh, okay, you don't want that salesperson right. on your team, right. right? Yeah. But if they go, well, wait a minute. I think you might have the wrong idea. I, I think I'd be a good fit because right. I have, you know, I have character, I have confidence, I have self-esteem, plus I've generated X thousand. Well, then, then we would likely Over. bring them in for an interview, right? right? So, right. Yeah. so you put them into a role right. in your, your recruiting model that's similar to having them do some of the work, yeah. right? So then after they come through the group interview, one of the next steps we like to give them is we like to get, have them take an assessment. You know, we like to use Colby, K-O-L-B-E, mm, yeah, Colby, yeah. Right? yeah, who's awesome. Um, and we don't make it required for HR legal purposes because there is a cost to take that particular assessment. Mm -hmm. um, so they do that as an option, or they can take a DISC assessment, which is free. You can go online and search mm -hmm. DISC. And we like to just get an idea of their strengths, yeah. their capabilities, how they operate in a in their natural natural setting. Yeah. So that becomes a good. Then we would look to bring them in for a one on one interview after these steps, right? right? And now we sit down, we go through more of the company, why they'd be a good fit personally. And if we have good chemistry and we feel there's potential there, we like to assign them a test, right? Like um, right now we're in the process of uh, finding, uh, filling a role for a marketing assistant, mm -hmm. right? And we had people, we sent them to these random podcasts, right? Because one of the HR rules is you cannot have people do work that you're actually going to use without paying them. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So we just say, hey, we want you to do a test. Here's two random podcasts. You know, we give them the name and titles. So go through the podcast and then uh, write a, a summary report on what you learned from that podcast. Right. Mm. And we are looking for quality. We are looking for the presentation and we want it to be X number of words. Right. Yeah. But now it's about packaging. What are they putting together? And you can tell if they can spell, you can tell if they can format, and you can tell if, you know, certain things. And ahead of that, after we send them this project for these two podcasts, before they start, we say, estimate, Jeremy, how long do you think it will take you to do this? Because you can take a week to do it, you can take you know, a few days, or you could take a few minutes. Right. You get to decide how long is this going to take based on everything you have going on. Maybe you have another job, etc. And it's interesting to watch how they respond to that. Yeah. What's an interesting question. response you get? Like if they're motivated, will they say tonight? Or? I'll have it tonight. Yeah. Right. I'll have it tonight. Yeah. Right. And the, the beauty of it is you start to see, again, putting them in the position to do the work you're going to likely have yeah. them doing with you and for you. Yeah. Um, so that gives you an indication. So now if they kind of, they go through that assessment and pass, now they can come back for another interview and we'll go through other formal questions there are certain questions that we have again i can get you some of this yeah. more, you yeah, better believe you're drilling and getting the right person <laughs> yes you're not leaving anything to chance with this no and by the way even with yeah. this process it's still not a perfect science that's a scary thing yeah yeah and um you know you're still you're likely going to have uh i would say seven out of ten that will fit but there'll be three out of ten that just won't yeah. uh, even after going through something but i will say this even as all of these pieces that we're talking – oh, and by the way, a third and final interview I like to do mm -hmm. before you officially hire them is interview them in a restaurant. Okay. Right? Breakfast or lunch, not a dinner, but typically. Uh -huh. Breakfast or lunch, casual, yeah. and see how they are around staff. Mm. I learn more in five minutes, mm. ten minutes, and how they operate around wait staff than I do in an office setting when everything is great. Yeah, uh, you can see their That's manners. That's a great point. Yeah, you can see their their upbringing. You can see if they are respectful. They have gratitude, right? Mm. How they were. I mean, it, it, there are just a lot of little nuances that will give you a bigger story of them very quickly, mm. right? Yeah, I love that. So, Dan, where does Laura Rubich come into play? Because I know oh, she wow. was a big influence. Huge influence, you know, Laura, Laura Lori. Um, huge influence, one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, I remember uh, I met Lori in 1994 mm -hmm. in that co the company I told the environmental company in mm -hmm. the seminar seminar business. And I remember seeing her at a seminar that she did 
back in 1994 in Chicago, by the way. Oh, okay, she's nice. From, she, she's actually from Hinsdale. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Hinsdale, yeah. So you know that area. Not far, and, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so I was inspired by her, and there was another gentleman named Mark. I forget his last name right now. But uh, Lori and Mark, and they did this event. It blew me away. And it was part of the catalyst for me in being involved in personal development where I wanted to teach, mm -hmm. right? And I had a chance later on back in – I think it was 1998-ish, that I got a chance to actually work with Lori directly. Mm -hmm. I worked with her personally. I ended up moving to uh, Florida. And oh, there, wow. was a, there was an incident. I was in this particular company, and I remember I uh, went to Louisville, Kentucky sometime in 1996 or 97. I think the years might be a little off. Mm -hmm. And I was struggling. I'm surprised you remember all this. I would never remember <laughs> the years of any of these things. I mean, you're sparking like yeah. all of these like things, yeah. you know, right? So and, Louisville, uh, Kentucky. Yeah, I lived yeah, there. For, I lived there for a year. Yep. Yeah, great, great yeah. little city. But I, I actually drove there with the idea that I was going to talk to Lori. That because the business was where it was at, I was going to have to quit. Mm. I was going to have to stop. Why? Uh, th I mean, things just weren't going well. I wasn't, you know, really prosperous. It was just things seemed like such a struggle. Yeah. And I was going to start looking at other paths to take. And I remember she got done with the event. And I said, hey, Lori, I need to talk to you. It's pretty important. She said, great, come on up to my room. So I go up to her room. And I remember she got a phone call. At the, It was her boyfriend at the time. And I'm sitting there. And she says, um, I can't talk right now. I'm with one of our key leaders. And I looked around like, is she, is she talking about me? Like, what the hell? And, uh, and then he kind of pushed on and she goes, no, no, seriously, I can't talk right now. I'll call you later when I'm done. Uh, I'm talking to one of our key leaders. And I like thought it was like really strange. So she hung up and she turned around, she sits down and she goes, so what do you, I go, well, what, 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 I'm confused. She goes, I see you as one of our key leaders. And like just to give a perspective now, by the way, that at that point, I was many years through my businesses. I had a, <laughs> several years of business behind me, three companies or whatever it was, a uh, lot of personal development. I was going to two seminars a month for like four or five yeah. years straight at that wow. time. Wow, wow. And when she said key leader in my company, in our, in our company, I didn't see myself as a leader. Hmm. Right. And the reason I share that story is because, you know, maybe if you're, someone might be listening right now, there's roller coasters that you go in in business. I truly believe in my mind's eye today that how we see ourselves ultimately determines our destiny. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, I didn't see myself as a successful business owner. Yeah. She did, though. And when she had that belief in me, because then the, the conversation continued and Ultimately, I said to her, I said, Lori, I actually came here out of respect to you because I was going to let you know. I know you've invested mm. time and energy and mentoring with me, and I'm going to, I think I'm going to pack it up. And she goes, You can't do that. You're one of the best leaders. In fact, she's got, I've got a better idea. I want you to move to Florida, and I want you to work side by side with me because I think if you and I work together, we'll break every record in the company. Mm. And I was like, Holy shit. And I get chills even saying it right now. Yeah. And I said, well, when do you want me in Florida? Now, mind you, things weren't going that well. Finances were really tight. And I was living at that time. I think I was in Nashville, Tennessee. And she said, I want you there in two weeks. Can you make it happen? And I said, I don't know how I will, but yes, I'll make it happen. And I ended up getting back. I didn't know uh, how I was going to do it. And by the way, this is when I started writing this journal. The book that you have in your hands actually came out of this, this because... Yes, yeah. because when I went from Nashville to work with her in Florida, I didn't want to show up and not be the very best I could be. So literally at that moment of all the events and all that, and I didn't invent any of the things in my book. I What I've had people tell me, wow, you've taken all these things like Tony's stuff and Brian Tracy's and Tom Hopkins and all these things and you made it simpler yeah. and condensed it down into a simple, usable practical format and, and initially I wrote this stuff for me <laughs> it right. wasn't really designed for anybody it was for me <laughs> it was for you in and two I, weeks to be ready yeah two weeks to be ready and I yeah. literally got obsessed and I answered those you know I, I, I talk about it in the book I talked to okay who does Dan have to be the qualities 
you know, you know, confidence, faith, you know, listed all these things. Then it was like, what am I grateful for? What am I happy? About? What have I done? And I got obsessed and I did that twice a day, every day prior to the two weeks. Hmm. And oh, by the way, I had like, I don't know, a thousand dollars to my name at that time. I hauled to Florida. I didn't even have a place to live. I just drove to Florida. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> Talk about faith, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I get to Florida and she goes, hey, it's good to hear from you. But when are you going to be here? I said, I'm here. She goes, you're here. Where are you living? I said, well, I'm at this comfort inn. <laughs> right. Right. That I found on whatever, uh, Highway 9 or I forget what it was on, uh, I forget the, forget where it was in uh, Tampa, Florida. And she goes, oh, well, she, are you going to just stay there? I said, I, I'll stay here as long as I can. And ideally, if there's somebody that I could stay with that you know of, that'd be great. I can rent a room or whatever. And so- right. Not too long thereafter, I ended up finding a place. I think it was a month later <laughs> that I ended up, you know, getting getting a finding a house that I could rent, and ended up working out. But we did start conquering. We did start, you know, uh, I turned things around in less than ninety days. I think I had earned and generated more business in that ninety days than the previous nine months combined. Yeah. And within another six months or nine months or so, so it had been about a year total. I had more than doubled the previous years uh, company revenue, right? right? Which also increased my earning potential quite a bit. And so I was really grateful. It was a great opportunity for us to connect and get together. And, um, you know, I owe a lot to Lori for her belief in me. And it also taught me a lot about being a great coach. It taught me a lot about being a great mentor and also really paying attention to the little things that matter like these rituals. Yeah. So Dan, what was it in those 90 days that it turned everything around? Uh, I, I, if I had to pin it to one main thing, I'd say it was attitude. Really? So just totally. by you going down there on faith and um, was there anything being around her? Because obviously initially you were inspired by her. Yes. From the beginning. Yeah. So I would say attitude, uh, those practices that I started putting in place yeah. that I got obsessed with changed me as a person, mm. right? And then the other thing that I actually did as part of the process of what I was doing is I started teaching these things to other people mm. and I saw them change. And so when I was changing and I saw people that I, these, you know, I, at the time it was three questions. What am I happy about? What have I done well? What am I uh, grateful for right now? I watched as they did this consistently how their lives changed. It was like flowers blossoming and we all got to blossom together and it boosted my confidence. It boosted my esteem. It boosted how I saw myself. So my attitude start, you know, Jim Rohn, right? The late Jim Rohn, he says, your business and your life will grow to the extent you do. Mm. And I became at that time, I think yeah. I became this, uh, you know, this, this tree that just started to flourish that apples you could pick off of it. Yeah. And yeah, you know, I think that would be the big, biggest thing. And coming back, part of the five uh, things that I talk about today, emotional mastery. I think it, emotional mastery and mindset, I started to really understand that. And in fact, you know, I, I think back to how I had built my business because growing up in the inner city, right? I thought baseball would be the way out and I thought it was going to be a way to take care of my family. I mean, there were times as kids we were on welfare and different things like that. Right. And so I always huh. wanted, yeah, the best for, for them and, and, and for me and what would be my future kids. And in my businesses, I feel to a degree for a long time, I was chasing money, right? And as the old adage goes, when you chase money, you'll push it away. Mm. And there was a point in this process, by the way. I actually said to myself when I was going to go work with Lori, look, I'm not going to impress her with the money I make or in that case I wasn't making, mm -hmm. right? But I can go there and be the best me, mm -hmm. right? And I can be a great human being. And That's a that tough process, thing. It's tough. It's tough to say that. You know, now you can look back and, and yes. it seems simple, but it's tough to actually come to terms with that, I think. Yeah, and no, no doubt about it. It wasn't, uh, I mean, I literally remember, I remember going through it, Jeremy. I mean, I haven't, I don't know that I've ever, I think I've talked about this before, but it's been a long, long time. And oh, this is amazing. I appreciate you sharing. This is, this I, is uh, uh, 
as Roy Firestone said to Jerry Jerry Maguire, you're not going to make me cry. <laughs> 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 uh, like um, so uh, I remember just thinking to myself, look, it is what it is, and just go be the best you. Yeah. Right? And she was already at that time, she was a multimillionaire, and I wasn't. And I was like, okay, what can I offer her in value, right? Yeah. The other part was it really got me to shift perspective. Again, shifting away from chasing the money. I literally remember throwing most of my goals away, right? And I look back at it today, most of my goals were material. You know, I'll earn X dollars and I'll build this business and blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. And I'll have this car. And this. so they were material. And I literally threw them away. Yeah. And it became just about being a better human being, a yeah. better person. And when I got there, I mean, I think I was doing the same presentations. But I was a different. There was human something being. different internally that yes. you were thinking. Yeah. And as you know, as you know, the old adages go, in order for things to change, we've got to change. Success starts from the inside out. Yeah. In order for things to be different, we've got to show up different. You know, Mark Victor Hansen, you've got to be to do to have. So you be the person, do yeah. the action to have the result, have the outcome. Yeah. And I think I showed up at that time and I started to realize what that really was. Mm. And then I got so fired up and so lit up by sharing and teaching this to other people that it like I said, it created now these blooming flowers together. Wow. That is yeah. really powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. Yeah, thanks thanks for digging that out Jeez. of me. <laughs> wow. So Dan, looking back, you've had a lot of milestones, amazing milestones in your career. What are some when you think back that are the most memorable to you? Uh, my kids being born. Yeah. No, no doubt about it. Uh, I would say that's my proudest uh, moment. My proudest moment is any time I can be with my kids. My proudest moment is when I can be present with my wife, with T. And uh, I do my very best to spend a lot of time with with them. Yeah. And I'm not perfect at it by by any means, right? If you're going to be successful, I you know I hear people talk about balance quite a bit. Yeah. And I battle it a bit where I think balance truly is BS. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, I think you can strive for having a holistic life. Yeah. I don't know that balance, because, you know, like I think of sports, right? I think you and I have had this conversation. I agree like, with you on this, but go. I want to hear what you have to say. Yes. Yeah. Go on, go Derek, on. Derek Jeter, to yeah. be a, an insane great baseball player that he was for his 20 year career, he had to be consumed yeah. with that sport. Right. Right. I mean, he took holidays off, you know, you know, family time off and, you know, when you're in season. Yeah. And if you want to be great at anything, most of the people that I know that are truly at that pinnacle level, yeah. there's a certain thing that you've got to be willing to say no to in order to say yes to the Something's thing. Something's got to be sacrificed. Yeah. yeah. Now, with that being said, it comes back to now, how do you treat yourself as a all pro or all star person? Right. Some of the biggest change that I made, changes that I made after my hospital experience, Jeremy, when I was on the table, I was in the hospital for four days with this heart issue. So how old are your kids at this time when you have this, the heart issue? It's two weeks after my son was born. So it was two weeks after, okay. Yeah, literally, proudest moment as a dad. My son, second proudest, obviously my daughter two years prior. Right. My son is born. I've been building these companies, been working so hard to have this culmination now i'm going to have my little boy my little bambino is going to be his you know a spit <laughs> image of his papa which is me and he's going to be this you know athlete potentially and, you know, whatever, right yeah. i'm going to be a guy who you know sets values and i wake up one morning and I, my throat is closing my chest has pain and i felt like i couldn't breathe wow. and i was in a panic I remember telling my wife at the time, now ex-wife, and I say, uh, Elisa, I'm not feeling well. And she started to take Kira, Kira and Kyler out for a little stroll. And, or No, I'm sorry. Kyler was with the nanny. She was taking Kira out for a stroll. And she goes, are you okay? I said, I think so. But I called my doctor and I said, hey, I'm, I'm like having a weird thing. I'm like, I explain in, you know, my throat, my chest. He's like, uh, 
how close are you to a hospital? And I said, well, I, you know, it's like two Not miles. Not words down. you want to hear from the doctor. No. Yeah. Two miles. He goes, I don't think it's anything based on the way you're describing it, but why don't you go as a precaution? Yeah. And he goes, and I said, well, Lisa just left. I go, I think I'm going to just drive myself. He goes, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I think I can do that. So I, I, I hop in the car. And as I think back on it today, Jeremy, I don't remember driving there. Wow. Right. But I did get there. And I, then I remember going in the hospital and I say, hey, I'm having pains in my chin. You, as you know, in a hospital, being a doctor, that kind of sets, you know, all sorts of red flags. Off. Yeah. And so they sit me in a chair right away. They get the thing on and they take my pulse and my blood pressure and they're measuring me. And then all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. And they're like, they bring a gurney. We need to get you in right away. And so they put me on this gurney and they stroll me down a hall. And next thing I've got buttons and lines and wires all over wow. me like within an hour of being there, it scared the hell out of me and you know so they do all this analysis long story short i think it was the second day the doctor says you know we've seen some arrhythmia going on in your heart and so we need to do this surgery now all of this by the way came back as ended up being false alarms everything's been fine but th to do the surgery which they did do you know they run this thing up your body and into the heart and Ugh. I had to sign a disclaimer. I have a one in X chance of dying Oof. with this procedure, right? And it's one in a couple hundred. And it doesn't matter what it is. It's one no, in something. Yeah, you're right. Chance of dying. Right. And I remember being in the hospital, sitting there or laying there, scared to death. Yeah. And literally, and I cried like a baby that night and I wrote my last what – potentially could have been my last will Oh my God. for hours, like three, four in the morning. I'm writing like pages of these notes for my, my wife. My son is two weeks old, mind you, and my daughter's two. Right. And then there was some point in that night that I had a epiphany transformation in my mind and said, when I come out of this, I'm going to make some changes. Yeah. And number one, it's to be a dad. Number two, it's to focus on right. my health. Right. You know, at that time I was overweight. I was, you know, almost 65 pounds or 70 pounds heavier than I am today. It's hard to picture that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's hard to look at that picture of <laughs> that picture. Wow. Um, and when I come out of this, I'm going to make some changes. So long in the story, I ended up coming out of it. Right. Um, I set myself up. Thank goodness for Joe and Genius Network. I met some people who had sold companies and had an exit stra strategy. And so I put the process is now in place to set the stage to sell my companies. Within 18 months, I had a buyer. Within two years, I had you know, sold the companies. I licensed my name. That was a little bit of a, a messy scenario, uh, and I learned a ton from that too. But nonetheless, I sold the companies, and I was able to spend time as a full-time dad mm. for a window and then really get my health in order. I'm so grateful today for my health. I'm so grateful that I was able to have – that quality and quantity time with my kids. Uh, I think it's made me a better human being, a better dad, a better entrepreneur today. And now there are certain rituals that are just non-negotiable in my life, yeah. in what I do. Like what? Uh, like, for example, when I wake up in the morning, uh, six out of seven days, I wake up early, you know, 5.30, 6-ish, 6 6.15. I don't wake up usually to an alarm. Uh, and when I get up, I exercise pretty much right away. I jump start the day with exercise and I usually listen to, you know, positive uh, audios. Like today I was listening to your podcast oh, I'm honored. <laughs> uh, yeah. right, to, uh, to be able to get ready for, for today's show because I wanted to hear and get connected to the spirit of you. And you're fantastic at what you do, oh, by the way. Thank I you. love your interviews. I love when you, you didn't start it with me today. I was kind of surprised by that because I was preparing. What's your low point? You, 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 asked you that. went right into it. I didn't even <laughs> need to ask it. You know, that low point in the hospital. Yeah. You know, yeah. Oh, did I duck into that early? No, right now. Oh, okay. I, I mean, yeah, you're one step ahead of me the whole way. So, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're a great interview. Yeah. I can see why you, I mean, having, what is it, over a thousand interviews that it's, you have? Over the years, it's approaching that, yeah. Wow. Not quite That's, that, but yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, thank yeah. you. And so I wake up in the morning. I actually, usually it's cardio today. Uh, you know, 30 to 45 minutes. 
you know, I have my Fitbit, which tracks my steps. I work for 10,000 steps every day, yeah. 30 to 45 minutes of exercise. Usually I follow that with some sort of meditation in the morning. Yeah. I eat typically a paleo type diet, mm -hmm. right? Then later in the day, like last night, one of, one of my rituals with my, my wife is meditating together. So we were able to meditate. Uh, also, by the way, back to the front part of the day. Yeah. After exercise, usually between the time my breakfast is being is cooking and that break time, about 20 to 40 minutes, I'm actually writing, journaling. Yeah. Like for example, you know, one of the things that I've done since you know the 90s is I keep a journal on all the things going on with interesting questions. You know, Tony Robbins, right? Yeah. You know, the quality the, of questions. The quality yeah. of life de is determined by the quality of questions. Yeah. And so I'm a huge note taker and also someone who yeah. loves to write. So yeah. I, I love to get into So what's that. lately? Huh. What uh, is there anything interesting today that you wrote down? Any good questions? Well, let's see what I wrote. Yeah. yeah. So today I and If you can't share it, that's cool too. So no, personal. no. Okay. So uh, the last couple days over the last six months, I've been uh, deep diving into emotional mastery. One of my good friends is uh, Dr. Christy Lopez, who if you yeah, follow the show, I, Growth sure. to Freedom. Growth uh, to Freedom, yes. Check out, everyone should check out Growth to Freedom. Some amazing interviews there. And you've interviewed some amazing people as well thank throughout you. the years. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So she is someone who's become a good friend. So we're collaborating. We're going to be creating a uh, audio program together on mm. emotional mastery. Cool. Right. I'm going to bring the uh, uh, I, I, I think I'm the entertainment and she's the science. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure yeah, I'm over kidding. the years you've picked up a lot of the science too. So, yeah. You know. yeah. So, uh, so like right now I'm talking about getting leverage, right? When we have a lever big enough and strong enough is when we can make change. So this may sound a little bit strange and taken out of context. It might not seem like, well, this is not the normal. So some of the questions is uh, that I asked myself today, yeah. Are, I love hearing this, Dan. I really appreciate it. I love this. Go on. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what am I happy and fulfilled about, mm -hmm. right, overall? And then what am I unhappy with right now? What, what am I disturbed by mm -hmm. and what am I disgusted by? Hmm. Why do you make that right? distinction, unhappy and then disturbed? I like to package it. Yeah. Right? Uh, the yin and the yang, hot and cold. Yeah. Also, here's the other thing. Uh, going into this deep dive on emotional mastery, it's, I think it's so much easier to have mastery of our emotion. I think the quality of our life, if I had to sum up the one thing that could dictate most people's success or failure in life, because isn't it interesting, Jeremy? I mean, you've seen it with all the people you've met. How many people that maybe don't have what most of us would consider success, but they're happy as, happy as anything, right. right? And then there's other people that seem to have it all, but they're unhappy. Right. Right, my greatest regret so strange. would be that I didn't enjoy the ride while I was building my companies. I took it a little too seriously, too much of the time, and mm. I had too much stress. And therefore, it's why that ritual or those rituals, although I had certain things of success, most yeah. people would admire. At the end of the day, for me, it landed wasn't you in I, the hospital. Yeah, yeah it landed me there. So, staying grounded to that. What am I happy? So. Another great way to do this that I've discovered is create a list of the positive emotions. Like think of your last seven days, right? What are the emotions that you've had in the last seven days the most frequently? Mm -hmm. And then categorize them as positive emotions mm. and then a separate list of the negative emotions. Right. And, you know, Chris, Dr. Lopez and I, we've uh, gone through this with different people. And sh what she recently shared in an interview we did on an episode was that, 90% of the time when she asks someone that question, they can't name 10 emotions. Mm -hmm. And when we can't even name 10 emotions, it's no wonder why we don't have the joy, the passion, the fulfillment, you know, what some people would call happiness right. that we want. So one way to simply have a better quality of life is simply start naming and coming up with the language around emotion. There's a great book I've got on my bookshelf over here called Feelings that I was introduced to probably 10, 12, 14 mm. years ago. Who wrote that? Just, Feelings. Okay. Uh, hold on. Let me yeah. grab it real quick. So Carol Trauman, Feelings, hmm. Buried Alive, Never Die. Hmm. And 
I mean, literally, there's hundreds of different feelings and emotion. Uh, I've got this thing earmarked for the last. 10 I can see years. it's like <laughs> different things. The reason this is such a great book is just because it gives you the a naming convention to list out your feelings. Yeah. Right. You know, Tony Robbins, for example. You know, Ma first of all, there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And then Tony has his six human needs. And I like Tony Tony's because uh, they're very simply certainty, uncertainty, uh, significance, love, growth, and contribution. Mm. I mean, even those six, if someone got really honed in on naming those and trying to live with those six, right, you know, versus some of the negative emotions. Like, now, for example, some of the emotions that I, I'm going to list here that I've dealt with in the last seven days, uh, frustration, guilt, embarrassment, humiliation. The past two hours I've experienced that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, sadness, right? So these are some of the negative. But on the other end, I've got, uh, let me go through them real quick. So I've got joy, I've got passion, I've got purpose, I've got meaning, significance, love, connection, contribution, growth, mastery, uh, confidence, commitment, courage, right? Yeah. And today it's so much easier for me to name the pop. But here's the here's the game to this, Jeremy. Right? Yeah. At any imagine having this list, which I keep this with me all the time. Imagine having access to this list, and that quickly you can shift from say frustration to joy, right? Just by naming it. And another way to do it. So here's powerful. another game, right? Yeah. And you know, yeah. I mean, you teach some of this. Uh, I know. So I'm preaching to the choir, but I, I just love the psychology. You can never of it. hear this too much. Yeah. Yeah, these little things, right? Joe Polish talks about it in terms of little hinges swing big doors, right? right. right? And I believe the little things are, are big things in this case. Because imagine who we all could be if we had emotional mastery, right? What would that look yeah. like, right? We, and by the way, if we were at our best, operating at a peak state, what could we do? What difference could we make? What impact could we make in the world? So. A game to play is if you have a negative emotion, which are normal, right? Which, by the way, Christy Lopez had to teach me that those negative emotions are normal. But they're a great place to visit, not necessarily a great place to stay. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, a good point. And, yeah. yeah, so we, we get to choose that first letter in the champion family values. We get to choose it. Yeah. So in a moment's notice, you, me, we can all choose what emotions that we're living with. Yeah. And, and if we want a high quality of life, just start coming up with more positive emotions that we're living with. Right. So that, that, yeah. that, uh, that's something right now. So that this was something I was writing today. Yeah. I, uh, I hope that was helpful. Very helpful. <laughs> yeah. You know what I love about one of the things I love about your book is, um, which everyone should pick up the a champion in the making. This one is, um, where you map out your ideal day. And it's so yes. powerful to see you do that, the, the exercise of doing that, that we don't even consciously map out our day, like our, our ideal normal day. And so I thought that exercise alone, reading what you wrote is powerful. And then just just knowing you, sh everyone should be looking and, and probably doing that. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, a vision in your ideal day, yeah. I think chapter 23-ish or so. Uh, in the book, and one of the things that I oh, now have over the last couple years, I like to do that quarterly. Now, oh really? So you redo it and and yeah. start the year with it. Wow! Right, looking yeah. back, you know Dan Sullivan he, uh, from Strategic Coach, right out there in Chicago. Yeah, he calls uh, a version of this the R Factor question, which is a great app, a simple adaptation. Which uh, let me make sure I've got it correctly. What would have to happen in order if we look back a year from today, mm -hmm. right? So wherever you're at today, look one year from now, look back over the year as though it had happened and then define what would have to happen in order for you to feel happy and satisfied with your progress mm -hmm. of, of that. Right. And so it's just it's a, a great yeah. thing to be able to project. So each year now, I like to do this at the beginning of the year, like in, instead of a New Year's resolution, yeah. I like to do a declaration. And I believe in declarations mm -hmm. more than I believe in affirmations, <laughs> right? Decl you know, there's the You're declaration. Act on it. Of, yeah, declaration of independence. Right? Yeah. And our country is one of the most powerful documents ever written. I think you deserve a declaration of independence. Mm -hmm. I deserve a declaration. I think we all deserve a declaration of independence. And yeah. it starts with making that declaration to ourselves of what, you know, using Dan's R factor, 
what would have to happen. Or if you go through my book, you can see the idea of the vision in an ideal uh, a day in your ideal life. Yeah. Dan, when you were in that really low point and you were in the hospital and you wrote down those notes, did you save those? Uh, my ex-wife has them somewhere. That's not a good place to have. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, I, I just imagine some of the gems that are in there from that, yeah. from those notes. Um, I want to keep you on all night, but um, Dan, I know you have to be with your wife soon. So um, <laughs> I wanted to talk about just for a second about some of your mentors. You talked about Lori. Who are some yeah. of your mentors currently or colleagues um, and some of the best advice they've given you? Oh, that's a that's a great question. There's so many. Yeah, I right? know you talked about your dad. You talked about Lori and yeah. Who who currently is do you turn to for advice? Well, I, number one, uh, I would say my wife. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a sounding board. You know, we talked about it earlier. The selection process and the five key key capabilities to have hiring slash selection uh, of a of a partner. And my wife is an incredible sounding board and mentor for me. I learn a lot from her. Uh, you know, she has a way to communicate with me that just gets me to see a different perspective. Because I'm a visionary. I go and... What does she do? Uh, she actually works for the government and she... Uh, I mean, does what does she do to, to um, I guess, when she talks to you in a certain way that, that actually grounds you or from your... Yeah, vision? I would say... Well, I would say that our chemistry is very playful. Okay. Right. And I think it's also why our marriage works as well as it does, uh, because we, we're just very playful with each other. Mm -hmm. We're like two kids that are 16, 17, 18 years old, and we laugh about anything and everything. Like one of the, one of the things we have about our relationship uh, is that we can laugh at nothing, which means everything. <laughs> right. And it's that that makes it work. So if yeah. I had to sum it up, it would be be that. And yeah. uh, so she's one. Joe Polish, right? I work yeah. with Joe. I've, I've been a big fan of Joe's for years. I mean, yeah. I uh, Joe was a client of mine to start with. And he uh, purchased an information product that I had created years ago, which was how to use radio as a platform to generate leads and sales. This is back in uh, yeah. like 2002 or three yeah. or something. And then he started his Genius Network uh, 25K group in about 2006 or so. He called me up and said, hey, Dan, uh, I'm starting this group. It's going to be 25000 to be a part of it. And you think you'd want to do it? And I was like, you know, Joe, you call me all the time to come hang out with you. And I've, I've always been to – if I write you a check, I'll probably come and show up more often. So I did. <laughs> and I was in his group for five years, and I kind of went, yeah. th went through that. And then after I sold my companies, I took a break. But we stayed friends. And that's one yeah. thing about Joe. He's the – if I had to pick what I've learned from Joe is it's about relationship capital mm -hmm. and creating transformational value, right, ahead of ever asking for something. Mm -hmm. He's one of the best in the world at that. Yeah. And I just respect that. The other thing I respect about Joe, what you see out front, right, is what you see behind the curtain too. Mm -hmm. Good, bad, or indifferent. And I respect that about Joe. Right. Also, he's just, you know, years ago, one of the challenges I had in the whole, call it self-development guru industry, there was a point in time, and I think I probably still deal with it today, is how people can be one way front stage and then backstage the, in the incongruency. Mm. It, it can be a little frustrating, but what right. I appreciate about Joe is that who he is front stage is who he is backstage. And he also talks openly about some of his uh, flaws and, uh, and vices. Uh, so it's relationship. It's about, you know, that integrity. Uh, he's a marketing savant, Joe. That and, comes uh, across pretty, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. He's just incredible that way. So, so Joe. So then beyond Dan Sullivan. Dan Sullivan, in my view, in my eyes of strategic coach, uh, he is the smartest human being I think I've ever met. Wow. Truly. I mean, from... From business to coaching to people, he's he is the guide from the side and the sage on the stage at the same time. <laughs> right. And he's his wisdom, you know, here he is, here's someone in his eighties planning to be a hundred and still making an impact and making a difference worldwide. 
and leaving a legacy. Mm -hmm. He takes over close to 200 free days off per year. Wow. And when one of the things about Dan, similarly, front stage and backstage are are the same, same person, yeah. Right? He isn't out there talking about free days, but then being totally consumed, <laughs> being a workaholic, right? Right? He literally, when he takes his free days, I mean, it. there's no phone, there's no technology. It's truly a free day, and I, I respect that about yeah. Dan. Uh, I mean, so many. I mean, we have a lot of people in Genius Network. I mean, just about all of them I learned yeah. something from. Uh, yeah, so, got, Dan, get, go back to Joe for a second. So, how did that conversation go for you to come on and be an advisor and CEO of Genius Network? That, that's a great question. Let me think back to how, how that happened. Um, you, Joe and I, had seen, he was concerned after my health issue, right? Uh, and he was like, you know, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm really just being a dad and working on a couple fun independent projects. And he said, hey, well, why don't you check out what we're doing? And so, you know, I advised on a couple things casually. And then we were in a meeting with, uh, as I recall, Richard Rossi, who he ran a company called Envision. I don't know. Do you know Richard? Uh, I know of Richard. I don't know him personally. Yes. So He does the just, company with like educating kids. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, inc I mean he's prolific at providing experiential training and events for high achieving kids. Right. Right. And he had a company called Envision uh, years ago. He built it up to about a hundred million a year and then he sold That's it. Amazing. Yeah. Back four or five years ago he had a non compete and then he started looking at the niche and where he could serve the market. And today, you know, he has uh, Da Vinci is the name of his education company. Mm. And you know they. I, I actually went to an event a few weeks back. It was me. I ended up in Boston. If you can imagine pulling up into a suburb of Boston, and they have a stadium full of kids. Wow! Right? High achieving. Did you bring your kids with, or did you just go? I didn't. I just oh, went okay. Uh, okay. myself. Richard said that I could bring my kids, but it just didn't work out time. I think they were with their mom or something. Yeah. But I wanted to go because I'd heard about Richard's events for Sounds years. So epic. I go there. Yeah. And there's, I don't know, 4,000 kids in the stadium, this wow. hockey stadium in Boston. And the event was life-changing for those kids. Wow. And the way Richard puts it together and, and so on. So Richard and all of us were having a conversation and he was asking me, well, what are you doing? And I told him and he had been talking to Joe and he goes, you know, you two ought to get together and talk about how you can help each other. Yeah. And so while well, one thing led to another and conversations and and you know, back and forth, I think it was over three to six months actually of, of us communicating and trying to figure out how a, two entrepreneurs <laughs> could come together and, and actually work together. Yeah. And so we call it the entrepreneur entrepreneurs <laughs> relationship uh, overall. Right. And uh, since that time, which was a little over three years ago, uh, it's been a lot of fun. I feel very blessed to, to be able to you know, be helping Joe be more of who he is at his best on the front, at the front stage. And there's a lot of things I do incredibly well, I think, that yeah. helps on the backstage. And, you know, we've grown the company quite a bit and just making a bigger difference today. And I think it's helped both of us be better versions of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, I was watching something and you were breaking down. You're really good at simplifying things and you're really good at simplifying it and creating a system around it. And I remember you talking about, which is powerful, about like the structure, the structure of yep. a company and most of the time we don't even think about structure. We just are doing our thing and you're talking about like the visionary and then you have the executor and then you have the, I think the accounting, marketing and, and one other thing and that sales and operations. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that I saw that directly from when I'm like, okay, I see the whole, you know, genius network and I see like you as being, I, I don't know, maybe I'm making this up as like the executor, like, Joe's like the visionary person and then you're like the executor and in charge of like a lot of the systems. Would you say that's about accurate or? I'd say, yeah, that's yeah. a pretty close, close representation. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it seems like an amazing combination there. So yeah. Um, and what's interesting is, you know, we talk about packaging, you know, I've gotten a chance to know, uh, I got a chance to meet Gino Wickman. I don't know if you know mm -mm, Gino mm -mm. and his partner, uh, they just wrote a book called Rocket Fuel. I'll, I'll make sure to introduce you Rocket guys. Rocket Fuel. Yeah, it's it's awesome. You'll you'll love it. And here's what I did. I, when I met Gino, I told him this when I met him. I said, you know, I had beat my head against a wall building my five companies and I'd gotten to a place where I, I guess intuitively, if there is such a thing in business, right? <laughs> I don't know that that's true. Yeah. But intuitively figured out some of these components. And then here's Gino 
and his partner, they had packaged all of this together, <laughs> mm -hmm. all in a simple like package that people can go to. Like if you go, uh, what is Gino's site? It's uh, the Entrepreneur's Operating System or EOS Worldwide, I mm -hmm. think. And they have all these incredible tools already pre-packaged. And what's amazing, I told Gino, I said, you know, there's things that I actually do and teach in videos that I didn't even know you before and even know your books, but it would almost be like we're cut out of the same mold, right, right for some. But yeah. he's got the whole package put together. I mean, it's amazing. And he makes it available open source yeah. Yeah. Uh, overall. So there's you know so much available today yeah. with education and simplifying our businesses. You know, because coming back to what we started the show with, right, which is, you know, putting ourselves in a role, Jeremy, where we spent 80% of our time, right, enrolling versus prospecting. Yeah. Well, in Dan Sullivan terms, you know, he talks about unique ability, right? You know, one of the things that all of us can just always be aware of and conscious of, and in my journal, I do this probably once a week or so, is really identifying what are my unique talents and abilities? Right. Where am I at my best? And what are the things I suck at <laughs> that I shouldn't be doing? And really, get what do you suck at? It. What What do you think admin you suck things. at? Um, Adam, admin, oh, gotcha. Like doing admin things yeah. is just not for me to do. Uh, yeah. Most most HR functions are not really things that I I, I should be doing yeah. for anybody, for them or me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And. Um, you know, I I, need, I I am best suited to be driving like marketing, sales, yeah. you know, culture, uh, communication, and sp inspiration in the, in the mm. company's growth growth plans. Yeah. yeah. So I have one last question for you, Dan, and this has been amazing. So I really appreciate your time with this and making the time because I know you're super busy. Um, but before I ask it, where can we point people towards? I know you have a couple sites, um, Growth to Freedom. I don't know if you want to take a minute and and tell people about that. Um, you have tons of videos on YouTube, which are really powerful too. Where should people check out? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to do two things if you're open to it. I'd Go love ahead. to make a special uh, package available for your listeners, uh, if that would be helpful I'd be upset for you. if you didn't do that. Okay, fair, no. fair enough. <laughs> so uh, I would say uh, I'll put together, I'll give my book away to everybody. Wow. I've got another book called Walking with the Wise. I was a part of like, 15 or 20 other mentors yeah. like Dan Kennedy and yeah. uh, Tom Hopkins and several others that I'll make available for free. That's no shipping, wow. just just free. I've got some a special audio program uh, on communication mastery. Mm -hmm. I've got uh, I'll put, make sure to put the video that we talked about earlier on the hiring model mm -hmm. and a couple other special resources. Yeah. We'll make that available at growthtofreedom.com mm -hmm. forward slash inspired. Okay. And if uh, people just leave their name and email address, they'll get access to that uh, that unique package. And then, you know, you can check out our show at growthtofreedom.com. Yeah. Uh, where weekly uh, we bring, you know, new interviews, new wisdom. I know we were fortunate and blessed to have you on the show. Yeah. And uh, you know, I'll make sure that, yeah, I would love to make sure everybody hears that interview too. Yeah. I mean, you've interviewed Brian Tracy, T.R. Becker, Mark Victor Hansen, just to name a few. Your YouTube videos, there's one where you're talking about the one-page tool, five key objective, key projects that support them, who's in charge, and the status. And that's really powerful. I mean, there's just so much on there. So they should check out, you know, Go Through Freedom, but also your YouTube uh, videos as well. I mean, there's so much here. Like, I have a, I'm not going to ask it, but uh, your bootstrap business book, there's an amazing story behind that and how you, oh, use, wow. how you use that to um, leverage and have incoming leads, which we did not talk about, um, which is an amazing story uh, as well. Um, but so last question. Is, and one last thing that yeah. I'd love to throw out there, yeah, by the way, ahead. you know, because of uh, the work that I do with Joe, and again, he is a mentor and someone that I just feel, uh, yeah, I don't think we would have met had... Joe, you know, Joe and I not had the relationship. So I'd at least like to throw a plug out for uh, Genius sure, Network. For sure. You know, I can learn more about Joe at GeniusNetwork.com. Yeah. You have or an Genius amazing ne event coming up in October, right? Yeah. Genius, GeniusNetworkEvents.com. We yeah. uh, bring some of the top thought leaders together Tony Robbins, John Paul DeJoria. Uh, you know, there'll be about 250 uh, high, high, uh, high achieving entrepreneurs. It'll be, it's a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, we bring contribution, connection, and collaboration together uh, to provide a, a place for entrepreneurs to get together to do deal-making, strategic partnerships, and uh, a whole lot more. Yeah. 
So my last question, thank you, Dan. And the last question is really what it's all about, which is um, you were going to tell me about your daughter and when you went to see her sing and what happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, uh, you know, talk about proud moments. So around Father's Day, uh, I think about a month before Father's Day, my daughter, Kira, she's nine. She, you know, she's, we have her in music classes and she's been taking piano and she's been taking guitar and so on. And she goes, daddy, um, I'm going to be doing something special at the recital, mm. but I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> right. <laughs> she's and, a true direct response marketer. She keeps yes. you. Yeah. Yeah. And she says, it's probably going to make you cry. Mm. And I'm like, what the heck is she talking to my wife? Like, what is she talking about? And so anyway, there was all this buildup over the course of, like I said, about a month, Jeremy, leading up to it. And then so, so we have her recital for her school, the spring recital. And we go to the recital. And I didn't know what to expect. And then all of a sudden, here's my daughter, not just with the, the people up on stage, but she's the lead singer. Mm. And she sings one of... Uh, my favorite songs from John Le Legend, which is All of Me, mm -hmm. Loves All of You. And at the time, you know, there were some instrumentals going on in the background. Uh, it was one thing, but when they stopped the instrumentals and it was just her singing solo, she was hitting notes as a nine-year-old. Yeah. And I was just, my I take my daughter out of the picture, that she hit that just, I mean, it took my breath away. But then compound that when it is your daughter, right. and then take your breath so away when it is your favorite song, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, that my wife and I have. I mean, it was like the perfect moment, yeah. right? Yeah. And as you know, as I think about that, a few th things pop up. Number one, how grateful that I am that we live in a time and a place and a great country like we do that we have the opportunity to provide uh, things like this for our kids, right? And we get the ability to go take advantage of you know all these incredible blessings and capitalism and build businesses and help people and make an impact. And number two is what life is really about for me. Like one of the biggest regrets that I had, I shared earlier, which is not enjoying the moments. Mm -hmm. And today, what I really strive to do is not just enjoy moments, but is to create memorable moments mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. And like even my wife talks about, wow, you just live life at a place <laughs> that it's, you know, it's adventurous. It's, it's fun. There is definitely uh, something to enjoy and that, you know, it's not running. Whereas before I think, you know, I achieved certain, like I remember going to Necker Island and it being something where, okay, what's next? Mm -hmm. Right. I got that adrenaline fix. What's this? Today, <laughs> yeah. I, I have come to a place in my life, and I think it was through my experience and my health challenge. Right. And then kids will do this, as you know, right? This Kids will do this with you. And I'm grateful that I get to truly do it with them and enjoy it with them yeah. and build memorable moments as often as possible. You know, uh, the old saying, it's, if infant butts were candy and nuts, it'd be Christmas all year round. Well, why not live every day like a holiday? Right. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take money either. Like for me, a holiday today is getting up. I choose to get up and exercise and build into my vitality and health. I choose to meditate and I'm in a peace, more peaceful place. Right. I choose that I can eat healthy. I choose that, you know, I get to write and be creative. Right. And then I choose how I live my day is with confidence and faith and focus and uh, the ability to contribute, to make a difference with purpose, with meaning. We get to choose that. And then I get to count my day off. You know, I work hard like you do, like chances are most of the listeners and viewers do here. And I get to count my day. I'm a proud moment of, you know, I'm, one of my, a couple of my pet projects down the road are going to be a pro program called leadandgrowrich.com. Another mm -hmm. one called Walks With My Wife. wife. Mm -hmm. Right? Walks with my wife. It's so simple, but not only do I get to exercise by taking a walk with my, but we, we have incredible conversations. And I want to create a movement because I think there are a lot of alpha male entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who get caught up in being entrepreneurs and building and growing. Yeah. And there's that bonding with our, our spouse and our wife that can have such a tremendous positive impact, almost like meditation times 10. At least that's been my experience. And I don't know where this will go, and I don't know if it'll catch fire or anything. But it's just a pet it works project. For you. Even, yeah. even for my kids, 
the idea of taking walks with your wife to me is just a healthy life experience that, you know, as I think about it, if I can duplicate that to my son, Kyler, so he watches me and he takes these walks with me and my wife too, mm -hmm. and he sees that and he teaches that to his kids. And maybe there are others that get inspired with this simple idea that they just take simple walks with their wife and right. share stories. And maybe they're discussing things like these types of questions and building memories and how they're going to do that. Right. Wow. What a, what a great gift. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so yeah. Yeah. Well, Dan, thank you so much. This has been truly amazing. Uh, I really appreciate it. Awesome, Jeremy. Yeah. It's, a, it's a pleasure, an honor. I hope we can do it again sometime. Yes. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.